afternoon. Thank you so much. And I'm really, really happy to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Paul Hirsch, ACE. And moderating the conversation is Cinema Editor Magazine's very own Adrian Pennington. Good afternoon. So welcome to the final session of EditFest and what promises to be a fascinating, a fascinating insight into the editor's art. Um, when, I, when I look at a, an editor's credits on IMDb, there are two things that strike me immediately as an indicator of, of their success. The first is whether they work with a director more than once. It seems to me there's no greater testament to an editor's value than to be trusted a second or a third time with a director's pet project. A second indicator of success is the variety of their projects. A valuable editor is as comfortable and successful at finding the story and pacing or character in a comedy as they are in a drama or a musical. On both of these criteria, Paul Hirsch scores big. He has worked for directors like Brian De Palma, John Hughes, Herbert Ross, not once, but many times. He has worked on films as diverse as Carrie and Mighty Joe Young. He has made comedies like The Secret of My Success and Planes, Trains and Automobiles. Comedy drama like Coupe de Ville and Steel Magnolias. He has crafted musicals like The Fighting Temptations, Phantom of the Paradise, thrillers like Raising Cain, horror such as Obsession, science fiction with Source Code, fantasy with Warcraft, action blockbusters like Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol. Paul's also an additional editor on Baz Luhrmann's Great Gatsby, provided, ex provided his expertise uncredited again on Life of Pi and World War Z. He also made Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back. That is one heck of a career. Um, so we're delighted that Paul is able to share his time with us today, taking his time away from editing Tom Cruise and Russell Crowe in The Mummy. So welcome to Edit First, Paul. Thank you very much. So I'm delighted to speak with you, and I'm particularly uh, eager to hear your insight into the clips that you've chosen to uh, present to us today. Okay. Um, but I think it would help frame our discussion um, if you could describe for us what editing means to you how you feel uh, you fit into the filmmaking process. OK. Well, first of all, I want to say it would be presumptuous to think that I could offer any new insights into editing. Uh, it's a subject that's been talked about and written about so much. And uh, there's a, in fact, uh, over 100 years ago, there was a writer named Ricciotto Canudo who, talk, who wrote about cinema as the seventh art. And he talked about um, the first six arts being the, uh, the arts that reflect rhythms in space, by which he meant painting, sculpture, and architecture, and rhythms in time, which included dance, music, and poetry. And he considered cinema the seventh art because it was sort of a, uh, a distillation of many of these as if, as if, a, uh, a, moving, uh, as if a picture had come to life, it was, it was painting in motion, or um, the aspect that I sparked to in particular was music and dance. I think there's a very close connection between what I do and music and, and dance. If choreography could be defined as the organization of movement in three-dimensional space over time. I think editing is the organization of movement within a two-dimensional frame over time. So this idea of rhythm and pace is very much at the heart of my approach to film editing. So um, I was excited to learn that you're um uh, that your mother was a dancer. Yes. And also that you studied music at the, um, the High School of Music and Art in New York. Yes. So uh, could you explain a little bit further about what music means to you personally, um, whether you learned to work with music via editing or whether it's something innate that is your natural sensibility? Well, I, I always, uh, you know, even as a child, I, my first love was always music. And uh, I guess because my mother was a dancer, I used to dance a lot when I was a kid. I remember. We had a, a big round mirror, for, I guess it was from some makeup table or something, leaning against the wall, and I would put on records and dance in front of the mirror and uh, imagine myself to be 
uh, Gene Kelly or somebody. I remember uh, we lived in Paris when I was a child from ages of three to about eight. And I remember seeing an American in Paris and the hero was a painter, my father was a painter, and the love interest was a dancer, and my mother was a dancer, and I was an American. I was living in Paris, and I, I saw the picture about a dozen times. So um, I always had very strong identification with music and dance, and uh, when it came time to choosing a high school, um, it was a public high school in New York. There were, there were um, several, I don't know if, if people or anybody is from New York, they know that there were technical high schools like the Bronx High School of Science or Stuyvesant, and then there was music and art, which reflected interest in the arts. And if I had gone to Bronx Science, I might have been a doctor someday. You know, like today I might have been a doctor, but I wound up going to music and art. And while I was there, I played the timpani in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And um, very wisely, I was advised not to seek a career as a timpanist. <laughs> And I went on to college at Columbia University, and I still didn't know what I was really interested in. And I um, majored in art history, and I spent many hours in dark rooms looking at projected images on screens and analyzing them. Of course, they were still images, but it sort of prepared me for a life in, in dark rooms looking at images. Sure. But uh, those sort of twin influences led me in the direction of film. So you've made a number of musicals. I mean, did you, do you, have you sought out musicals or have directors of musical projects sought you out or is that kind of just coincidence? Uh, well, I think some people have the idea that I just sit back and I, I, I get 10 offers and I think, oh, I think I'll do this one or I think I'll do that one. You know, it's not like that. You just, you know, you, you're out of work, you're looking for work, something comes along and it's a lot easier to say yes than to go looking for another job. So usually it's a, question of happenstance, um, you know, I, when I met Herb Ross, actually Herbert Ross approached me about doing Pennies from Heaven and I was unavailable at the time. So I recommended a friend of mine, uh, Richard Marks, and uh, then when Herbert was doing Footloose, he asked Richard to do it and Her Richard was unavailable and he said, well, why don't you talk to Paul, you mm -hmm. know, so uh, we sort of he re sort of returned the favor, but uh, I love editing to music. It it it, it gives me an opportunity to uh, use my dancing skills in a way. Uh, yeah, I don't look at now, but I used to be a pretty good dancer. I'm sure. And I, I when you were talking about um, growing up and dancing in front of the mirror, that that did that did have a little picture in my mind, and and I think it plays into the, maybe the clip that we're going to show in a moment because. I, there's the mirror that I have in my mind now, the picture of that, kind of imitates the, the moment from Footloose, which you're about to show. But uh -huh. could you introduce uh, the first clip? Tell us why you chose this particular... Uh, well, at first I want to say that when I, when I was presented with this opportunity to come here, um, I know that a lot of young editors want to learn how to do it better or something. But I'm not in... Uh, by uh, my disposition is not toward... Uh, didacticism or pedantry. I'm not interested in, in educating. I'm more interested in entertaining. So uh, that's always been my purpose. And uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll pick some clips that I like to watch. I think the audience will like to watch. And, and um, there are some stories connected with them. So in this particular instance, uh, this was a, um, a sequence that was shot. Uh, it's a dance lesson. It's when uh, Kevin Bacon teaches his friend Chris Penn how to dance. And because it, it's shot on, in many different locations, it was a number that came in a little bit at a time over several weeks. And when they were shooting it, uh, in fact, in, during the whole course of shooting of Footloose, none of the songs that were eventually in the film had yet been written. And um, the uh, the people involved in the, in the music in the film had chosen uh, placeholders or stand-ins to represent the kind of song that would be written to take its place. So essentially I had to edit every sequence twice because I would cut it once to the, the placeholder song, the temporary song, and then when we got the final song I would m make adjustments to it to accommodate the real song. So in this particular case uh, they were shooting the song, and it, came, it was coming in over weeks, and um, 
I was really uh, kind of unhappy with the song. I, I thought, this, this is a lousy song. And, and they were shooting it, and uh, my frustration was that it was kind of slow and draggy. And now they had shot all this footage to this tempo that we had to live with, because you can't change the tempo. At least you couldn't when it was on film. Now you could play tricks. But in those days, you were stuck with the tempo that you shot with. So um, we said to, the, to uh, Dean Pitchford, who wrote the screenplay and wrote the lyrics for many of the songs, I mean, look, Dean, this song, this song, we're not, this is a bad song. He says, no, 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 we tell you this is a hit. And no, 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 I'm telling you this is a bad song, you know. They said, well, we're stuck with the tempo. So we had our music editor find songs in the same tempo. And he said, see if you can find a song that represents what you think the song could be like. Okay. So the first, let's play uh, a little bit of Somebody's Eyes, uh, which is the song that the sequence was shot to. Okay, so that's enough. <laughs> so it's a lame song. It's a lame song. So, so we thought, well, what can we, you know, so the song that we came up with that actually has the same kind of draggy tempo was a song by Michael Jackson. If you could play that, please. Okay. That's enough of that. So you hear the difference. I mean, this song has life, you know, it was exciting and had life. So we said, write something like this, you know. <laughs> so, so they did. So here it is. So this is Footloose, um, Let's Hear It For The Boy. That's quite cool. Herbert Ross, who directed it, was a choreographer, so, you know, he, it was sure, sure. a lot, you know, it's mostly Herbert. but. He told me he gave Chris Penn, Chris had been a wrestler and not a dancer, and he gave him those moves because he thought as a wrestler he could do that kind of thing, the somersaults and the, anyway. It's, a, it's one of my uh, favorite scenes. <laughs> 